going beyond the headlines. Asking the questions you want answered. Exploring government policies and how they impact you. We are delving deeper. Good evening and welcome to Delving Deeper. I'm your host, Kimberly D'Souza. Joining us this evening is the Minister of Energy and Energy Industries and Minister in the Office of the Prime Minister, Minister Stuart Young. Minister Young, good evening. Thank you so much for joining us. Good evening, Ms. D'Souza. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure. Of course. Now, Minister, recently government would have adjusted the fuel subsidy. So, of course, we know that the prices for super and premium have increased by a dollar and diesel has increased by 50 cents. Now, the Prime Minister and the Minister of Finance, they gave their explanation as to why this occurred. But there's still talk in the public domain about the closure of Petrotrin and the result of it being the increase that we see or the adjustment of the fuel subsidy. Now, as the Ministry of Energy and Energy Industries, what can you say to further explain why this decision was taken? First of all, to explain why the decision was taken, I think the Prime Minister and the Minister of Finance have traversed that ground adequately. The, the simple point is that government had to take a decision as to whether we spend $2 billion in this fiscal towards a fuel subsidy, or whether some of that money could be utilized better for the people of Trinidad and Tobago and spreading it more evenly into other social programs and other programs, because ultimately this is the taxpayer's money. Interestingly, just this couple of weeks ago, I did address this matter in the parliament and frontally address that whole issue that you just raised as to whether if the refinery was still open, whether we would have less of a fuel subsidy, whether it would have been better for the people of Trinidad and Tobago. And just briefly, as I explained in the parliament, the refinery being open actually was draining our foreign exchange because we had to import crude. To buy crude, you have to pay in US dollars. Also, the cost of running the refinery, we came in and met a $4 billion write-off that again, the people of Trinidad and Tobago had to absorb. And I showed that even when the refinery was open, we were running an average of $1.2 billion a year of a fuel subsidy. So the refinery being open would have had no positive effect on a reduction of the fuel subsidy. And I just want to use this opportunity just to point that out because there is a false, fake, misleading narrative out there that if the Petrotrin refinery would be open, we would be able to get fuel prices a lot cheaper. The answer is no. The cost of crude would have gone up. The cost of running Petrotrin was a very high cost. And then we were paying US dollars to import the crude, an average of 55 million US dollars a month on importation of crude to put into the refinery. Now, Minister, the world is looking on at what's going on in Ukraine. And of course, we are doing the same as well. Now, has the government drafted any plans or even possible scenarios of how that will affect us both directly and indirectly? So the answer is yes. I mean, you know, often I tell people, your government is thinking, we are working and working constantly. So the answer is yes. There are two immediate effects to us in Trinidad and Tobago out of what is happening in Ukraine. There's the energy side of life. But also, there's what is going on with food and what people are seeing as global supply chains. I'm here to deal with the energy side of life. As I said a couple of weeks ago as well, we must take whatever lemons are given to us and make lemonade. So the conversations we are having is Trinidad and Tobago has immediate capacity to assist on the LNG side as well as fertilizer. There is now a global demand for things like ammonia, which go into making fertilizer. So that is the conversation that we're having, the Prime Minister and myself, and I've been having those conversations extensively outside of Trinidad and Tobago with an international audience because we do have a plan and we are working towards it. Of course, it affects us in a positive way as well, as you would have heard the Minister of Finance say recently in the mid-year budget review, that we have earned some extra revenue as a result of the sales of ammonia. Ammonia went from a price of 180 US dollars a metric ton to $1,400 US dollars a metric ton. Now, we don't get that directly, but we derive revenue off of the taxation of the ammonia companies in Trinidad and Tobago. LNG prices have risen, gas prices have risen. So whilst our production, unfortunately, is lower than we would like, 
we are deriving some additional revenue off of the increased commodity prices. Now, Minister, our country is heavily dependent on oil and gas. For the average person looking on, can you explain how this sector works so that they can be able to understand why? That's a great question. And I want the people of Trinidad and Tobago to understand, no matter what the naysayers are saying outside of there about it's wrong for us to be dependent on oil and gas, from my perspective, my point of view, and I'm putting this forward to the people of Trinidad and Tobago, we were blessed to be a hydrocarbon economy. So there are many countries, just look at our Caribbean neighbors, they don't have the oil and gas, apart from now some significant fines in Guyana and Suriname that are now getting off the ground. 99.9% .9 of our electricity is derived from our natural gas. Other countries have to import diesel, fuel, and other ways to make electricity. That's the first thing that we, the people, feel. Electricity that comes from our natural gas. The other things is a significant earner for us. The, the prices that we're getting now on the gas side, the prices for a barrel of oil, the prices from the derivatives in ammonia, methanol, these are the products that are made on the Point Lisa's estate from our natural resources. So we will continue to do what we have to do as a government to balance the use of our natural hydrocarbon resources. For us, the people of Trinidad and Tobago, for you, for me, for everybody outside of there, it has provided us with a decent standard of living throughout the years. We are one of the only countries in the world where you can have a free education from kindergarten, primary school, secondary school, tertiary school. Fortunately, we're able to provide those things for a lot of our citizens through the oil and gas revenue and the pet chem revenue that we've derived. We have a free medical healthcare system. There will always be naysayers. There will always be people who complain. Our infrastructure in Trinidad and Tobago, you know, I am a very proud Trinidadian and I will not go on any platform, international or local, and criticize our country of Trinidad and Tobago. We may not always agree with things that those in the political arena say, decisions that are taken, etc. But fortunately for us in Trinidad and Tobago, we do have oil and gas. And what has happened and how it's helped develop Trinidad and Tobago over the past few decades, we really are fortunate for that. But Minister, I mean, there is the conversation about renewable energy. I mean, how are we going to eventually make that transition to you know, a cleaner uh, substitute? The first thing to understand about it is gas is the cleanest hydrocarbon fossil fuel. You have coal, we all know the ill effects of coal and the global warming that is taking place is predominantly as a result of the continued use of coal to generate electricity in other more developed countries. You then have oil. Oil does have issues in the burning of oil, etc. Gas is the cleanest hydrocarbon fuel. So that's the first thing for us to understand. But secondly, your government is working towards the renewable side. We're about to sign off on 112.2 megawatt solar farm, solar project. It's going to be the largest in the Caribbean region. So that's going to come on an electricity grid. And then thereafter, we will move quickly for more. We're looking at the use of electric vehicles. In the last budget, we made it government policy, import electric vehicles. Of course, there's a shortage of electric vehicles for the demand that's taking place in the world right now. But we are looking to reduce on the transportation side by 30% our harmful emissions on the transportation side. So right now we're looking at the use of electric buses in Trinidad and Tobago. And we are encouraging our population. I'd like to use this opportunity, Ms. D'Souza, just to say electricity conservation. We can each take a decision, turn off the electricity when you're not using it. That helps with the global atmosphere, the global environment, the climate, and these types of things. So small things like that. We are also looking at, I'm working with the Minister of Public Utilities on the possibility of waste. So taking the waste on our dumps, converting that into electricity, combining it with other things. So the government is very active in getting us onto the renewable side because, of course, that helps us. The more gas we save, if we go more renewable, we can then monetize that gas for the people of Trinidad and Tobago. And we are doing our part in the global scheme. I'm looking at things like something called decarbonization off of all of the gas products in Trinidad, meaning the, the ammonia, the methanol, the other pet chems, UAN, urea, and on the oil side, it is capturing carbon, storing it and utilizing it for increased production, but basically taking that carbon dioxide, which is a harmful gas emission, and doing positive things with us and reducing our side. We're also on the 
and this is a bit technical, but you'll forgive me. This is also on the methane side, which is one of the harmful gases that is affecting our global environment. We are actively through NGC and Heritage looking at reducing the methane out there in our atmosphere, finding if there are leaks, etc., and also seeing if we can monetize the methane. So your government is very, very active in the areas. It's not only about renewables, but we're also looking at reduction of carbon, decarbonization, reduction of carbon um, dioxide, as well as capturing of methane leaks. Now, Minister, you're in charge of a ministry where it doesn't matter who is in the hot seat, they will always face scrutiny. And I think you're accustomed to this, given the fact that you were the former Minister of National Security. But as it relates to the handling of both Atlantic LNG and NGC, do these types of criticism affect us when we're doing business, both regionally and internationally? First of all, and thanks a lot for this, Mrs. Souza. let me tell the people of Trinidad and Tobago that there has been, under this government and certainly under my stewardship and prior to it, no mishandling of NGC and Atlantic LNG. There are a couple people outside there who continue to say that there's mishandling because that's the narrative they want to push. And it may not be their narrative. The government is very heavy, heavily invested in some sophisticated negotiations with respect to the future of Atlantic LNG. NGC, they only like to talk about the bad news. NGC has made over $2 billion in net profit within recent times, certainly in the last year under my stewardship. You don't hear any reporting of that. So you've gone from the first time ever a loss, which was accounting issues, and now you're in a profit again, a net profit of $2 billion. You hear nothing. One of NGC's subsidiaries, TTNGL, has been declaring some seriously good profits again. And this is a company that the public of Trinidad and Tobago can invest in. You hear nothing about it. I am not at all concerned about the Atlantic LNG side and the naysayers and a couple of people in particular who keep trying to beat that drum. At the end of the negotiations that are currently taking place with BP and with Shell, on behalf of the people of Trinidad and Tobago, when I'm leading those negotiations, I will be happy for the day when I can tell all of the story as to what we've been able to achieve for the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Just our renegotiations of contracts from the past within recent times, we've been re able to recover over half a billion US dollars that we would not have gotten, 500 million US dollars that the people of Trinidad and Tobago would not have gotten if we didn't go to those renegotiations and fight more for the people of Trinidad and Tobago. And we have a relationship of respect with BP and Shell. So when the full Atlantic story and the restructuring story is told, hopefully in a few months to come and a few months time, people of Trinidad and Tobago will understand. But I'm telling them tonight, let your hearts not be worried. We have been leading a fight on your behalves and we're going to come out better for the people of Trinidad and Tobago. That I am certain of. Now, Minister, I've heard TNT been described as a mature province. What yes. is a mature province? And of course, what does it say for our production numbers? Simple. In layman's terms, for you, me, and everyone to understand, oil and gas are resources that are exploited, but they're not indefinite. So every time you pull a barrel of oil out of the ground, Mother Nature doesn't reproduce a barrel of oil. So it's always going to be what you call a depleting resource. The same thing with gas. Every time a molecule of gas leaves the ground, whether it be offshore, onshore, it's not coming back. Those have taken thousands, if not millions of years to be produced. So every time you pull oil out the ground or gas out the ground, it's gone, it's depleted. So obviously we're a smaller province than some of the larger areas like Venezuela, Saudi Arabia, and these countries where they have huge expanses of land. We're only 5,100 square kilometers of land and we have some marine acreage as well. So as you pull the oil out, you pull the gas out, that's it, it's gone and it's not going to be replaced. So when you say you're a mature province, Trinidad has been exploiting oil for over a hundred years, as difficult as that is for you, me and others to understand. So for a hundred years of pulling oil out of the ground, the resource is going to deplete. We've been dependent on gas for the past few decades, which actually made us one of the most successful countries in the world, and we should be proud as Trinidad and Tobago in the gas industry. We were one of the first to develop it, one of the major ammonia, one of the major methanol producers, four trains of LNG at our height, etc. But as we pull that gas out of the ground, 
it depletes. So your production comes down. We're not sitting quietly and doing nothing about it. We've been negotiating. Shell is going to produce manatee, which is just about three TCF of gas, which is a field Loran manatee, Loran on the Venezuelan side. We got Shell to do that. We negotiated a PSC successfully that they're going to, to, to go into the ground on our side of the border for manatee and produce that. We're looking at deep water. There's onshore gas going to come. So we're looking at it. The ministry recently in December last year went out with a deep water bid round. So we're doing what we can. But there are other initiatives we're working on as well because we're fighting hard to ensure that for the future generations of Trinidad and Tobago, energy continues to be part of what we have here in Trinidad and Tobago. Now, Minister, you recently attended the Gas Exporting Countries Forum in Qatar. Can you just tell us, you know, what were some of the things that were discussed, especially as it relates to us here in TNT? So, yes. So the Gas Exporters Countries Forum is a gathering of over seven countries that actually sell over 70% of LNG in the world and have over 50% of the gas resources in the world. And we, Trinidad and Tobago, are one of the founding members. So that in itself should be a matter of pride and happened under the PNM government. So the Prime Minister and I went to Doha recently and we went with simple messages. But I'll tell you something, coming out of the presentations we made at Doha, I got a lot of positive reviews. In fact, it was featured in a lot of international newspapers. My messaging at Doha was a very simple one. Gas is here to stay. Gas is going to be a hydrocarbon fuel that is going to continue to be used for decades to come. So we, the gas producing nations, need to focus on where there's a negative story about move out of hydrocarbons. That's not so. It is the cleanest burning fossil fuel. It will be around for decades to come. Let us focus on it. Let us use technology to clean up the environment using gas. Let us use whatever is the new innovative technologies available and and ways of producing gas, capturing the carbon, all that I spoke about a short while ago, it was very, very well received. I was the youngest minister of energy in that gathering. And the, the reviews that I got afterwards, especially from the secretariat at the Gas Exporters Forum. And I actually think that is what spurned the CNN interview that took place recently because CNN reached out asking to do an interview. So we are actually having quite a positive impact on the International Energy Forum as well. Minister, I'm glad you mentioned the CNN uh, interview because I know you got a lot of criticisms for that. I mean, did I? Yes, I think you did. Um, I mean, what was the point of the interview really? So actually, I had a different experience. I got a lot of positive feedback. We had Trinidadians reaching out to me from all over the world, so proud that they saw us featured on CNN International Richard Quest's show. And what it was is to promote Trinidad and Tobago. I had a simple, simple message in that. And it reached where it needed to reach. Understand that I'm a Trinidadian speaking to an international audience about a country that I'm proud of and that I love, Trinidad and Tobago. The simple message was we have capacity on the LNG side, the ammonia and methanol side. And right now in international circles, that's an important message that hopefully one day we'll be able to show the people of Trinidad and Tobago why that is the important messaging. So if we have capacity, it means that we can be part of the solution now for what's happening in Europe and in the United States and other areas in the world that need ammonia and that need LNG. Once we have access to additional gas and we're able to get more gas to feed into LNG and ammonia, we are going to be part of the solution. So it actually was a very positive interview. The, the few naysayers... I mean, I had to smile. I understand why some of them are naysayers because they never had those opportunities. How, how do they beat back Trinidad and Tobago being on an international platform? And I will just continue to do my job. And I thought it was very positive for Trinidad and Tobago. And I will always, when I'm speaking about Trinidad and Tobago, put our best show forward. But I will never mislead a single soul in doing so. And I say that without fear of contradiction. Now, Minister, let's switch gears a bit. Um, I know that government wants to incentivize electric cars pretty soon. Um, how is it going to be affordable for the average man? Because there have also been conversations in the public domain that switching to electric cars may be a bit more than expensive than we anticipate. So we're already incentivizing. In the last budget, the last national budget, the Minister of Finance implemented government's policy now, which is no import taxes, duties, etc. on electric vehicles. The difficulty right now is 
the world, the developed world is moving in that, in that direction. So you can't get on the international market electric vehicles for everybody. So we've done that. The government has also announced within recent times we will be reintroducing incentives on hybrid vehicles. So hybrid vehicles use less more fuel from the pump and are cleaner energy burning vehicles as well. So that is a stepping stone in the right direction. Now, Mr. Young, as the Minister of Energy and Energy Industries, what has been your biggest challenge thus far? It's been very challenging because Trinidad and Tobago is a very small player. The energy sector is not about Trinidad and Tobago. The energy sector is about on the global scale. Where do we fit in in that whole big thing called the globe? So you're not dealing only with the local naysayers or the drop in production, the volatility of international commodity prices. For me, it is how do I make sure the people of Trinidad and Tobago derive the best revenue for our depleting resources? Two, how do I continue to promote Trinidad and Tobago as being a significant player in this global scheme that is the energy sector globally? And that is really the challenge. So the challenge is whilst our province, as I said a short while ago, is a mature one, you have depleting resources, but we have all of these international scale plants with capacity, etc. How do we make it work? And also, as we've been doing for the last seven years, how do we make sure that the people of Trinidad and Tobago, because that's a philosophy that the Prime Minister endowed on me, and I believe in every molecule of gas, every drop of oil belongs to you and everybody outside there who are called citizens of Trinidad and Tobago and myself. So I will fight at every boardroom, every negotiation to get better value for the people of Trinidad and Tobago. And I say without fear of, say without fear of contradiction, previous administrations and ministers did not put down the fight that we have been putting down in the last seven years. And I'm proud to have been part of that because immediately we've derived better revenue for the people of Trinidad and Tobago. And we continue to be on that world scale table when it comes to energy. Now, Minister, allow me to address the elephant in the room, the Paria diving tragedy, right? It's been three months since the tragedy. Um, the Commission of Inquiry has been established. What can you tell us at this point, especially given the fact that a lot of people believe that the government has been dragging its feet on the issue? Again, I don't want the people to believe that the government has been dragging its foot. And thanks for this opportunity. Once again, I want to convey my deepest sympathy and condolences to the families I'd come off a, a flight that was traveled over 24 hours on a Friday evening, got this awful news, went down to Paria the next day quite quietly, met with the families, saw them in their grieving process and their, their frustration and, and of course their whole anxiety, etc. And I felt it for them. The government took a decision when it listened to what was going on publicly. They didn't want the setup of the ministry investigative part of it, right? So I came out as a Minister of Energy under the law. The ministry has to do an investigation. We set up an investigative panel of independent people. Nobody attached the government to investigate it. And we were going to give them 45 days to determine and to provide us, the people of Trinidad and Tobago, the facts. There was a huge outcry led by the opposition that they want a commission of inquiry. Once a government establishes a commission of inquiry, and we did that in a record time, Within the space of a week, I came and announced a commission of inquiry. The Prime Minister, sorry, announced it first. I came and said Cabinet had taken the decision a week later to set up a commission of inquiry, who the commissioners are going to be. We have one of the leading jurists in the whole of the Caribbean, Dennis Morrison from Jamaica. We have a subsea specialist, which is where, unfortunately, the accident took place, Mr. Wilson. We have a former Attorney General, Mr. Ramesh Lawrence Mirage, Senior Counsel, who's going to be commissioned, counsel to the commission. And they are the persons who are now in charge of this. They have come out, they've been appointed, they've told the population the work that they're going to do, and they intend to start their hearings in August. There's nothing left for the government to do. So this is no longer a government conversation. We are going to participate willingly and do all that we can to make sure that the Commission of Inquiry is a success. Because I think the population, and in particular the families, need to know what went wrong and what caused that tragic accident. Don't let 
the politicians, once again, and in particular the opposition, lead us, the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, down the wrong road. Commission of Inquiry has been established. The government has nothing more to do with it. No one is dragging their feet. We also knew, always knew, sorry, that one of the difficulties of a Commission of Inquiry is they take time and there is going to be a much longer time frame. That's what was wanted. It's been established. Let's await the outcome. And Minister, I mean, closing thoughts uh, before we wrap the interview. My closing thoughts are that as the Minister of Energy, Energy Industries, Minister in the Office of the Prime Minister, let us see what we could do to continue to keep Trinidad and Tobago as a successful oil and gas province. Let us really pull in the right direction. We are seeing some of the successes of the work that we've been doing. There is a lot of investment still taking place in the energy sector. As I said, NGC has turned over a $2 billion after-tax profit. Let's look at the good side. Let's not allow those outside there to mislead us and to really give us the false narratives. As I said, and I addressed the petrotrain issue, where does a refinery fit in? The refinery was not helping with any lower cost of fuel. It was costing us, the taxpayers, hundreds of millions of US dollars a year to import crude to put into the refinery at a loss. Listen for the truth. And it's our Trinidad and Tobago. We only have one Trinidad and Tobago. I can certainly give my commitment and assurance to the people. I'll continue to do my best in wherever I am, now in the energy sector, for the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you. Minister Young, thank you so much for joining us on this week's episode. Thank you. Be sure to join us on this station at the same time next week for another edition of Delving Deeper. I'm Kimberly D'Souza, and on behalf of our entire crew, have a good night. Thank you.